Hi everyone, welcome to my channel Sparkling Horizons. Today I'm going to show you one of the most amazing places in Australia, Cape Luin. Cape Luin is the most southwesterly point of the continent where the Indian and Southern Oceans meet. I have decided to join a guided tour of the lighthouse which runs every 40 minutes from 8.45 a.m. to 4.20 p.m. The tour costs $21 for adults and $10 for children. If you are coming to Cape Luin, do not forget to take a guided tour. The highlight of the tour is climbing up the 176 steps to top of the tower where you can have a breathtaking view of the ocean and the surrounding landscape. You could also see where the two oceans meet and create a line of different colors and currents. It is truly a spectacular sight. After the tour, you can explore some of the other attractions around the Cape. There is a maritime museum that displays some of the artifacts and memorabilia related to the lighthouse and the maritime history of the region. There is also a cafe that serves delicious food and drinks with a view of the ocean. You can also walk along some of the trails that lead to the different viewpoints and beaches around the Cape. The scenery is stunning with rugged cliffs, sandy coves, wildflowers and forests. Paul Sophilus is the Lighthouse Senior Tour Guide. Having spent 24 years working at the Lighthouse, Paul knows the Cape best. So let's hear from him. Now, it's got modern technology now, but until 1982, which isn't that long ago, it didn't have electricity. So 1896 to 1982, they still had a lantern oh. for a light. So the fuel for the lamp was in the air in big drums. So lighthouse keepers in the daytime used to take 20 litre containers in their jerry cans, fill them with fuel, kerosene, and then have to carry them up the steps to the top, fill tanks up there, and then to keep the light on at night, they'd be on watch for a few hours. Every half hour they'd get the pump handle at the tanks that they'd filled in the day, and that kept the lamp there. So it was pretty physical work. What's in there now is 24 heavy duty car batteries, that's backup power, that'll keep the light on for three nights if there's a blackout. And then the computer that tracks and guides the ships and another computer that monitors the light. So if there's any problems with that, it notifies the workshop in three minutes. So it's all pretty self-sufficient. And that chain goes to the top. So how it used to work is at night before power, when the cable was at the top, every two hours, you'd grab a handle and you would wind 160 times. So 10 minutes you're winding, the chain of light goes up, and then when you're stopped, you wound for 10 minutes, then when you're stopped for two hours, the wave slowly pulled the chain back down. As the chain dropped, it turned a set of gears and it turned over. Okay. So imagine that, 150 kilo. Right, oh, so we'll head up the steps. Unfortunately, we don't have any full jerry cans for you to try out the carrying and battery the bike. Isolated place, and you got your family, it keeps you on the even cool. But it also had three keepers because they split the shifts. Because someone's always got to be on duty, so you do a four hour night shift at the top by yourself, keeping the light going. 
a four hour day shift when you did cleaning and maintenance inside, you looked after the whole site. So everything was your responsibility. So that was from your supplies. So your food, your basic food and your fuel would come every two months with the ship. And it would leave Fremantle and come down the coast and around the Cape and halfway back to Augusta was a big wooden jetty. So every two months they drop supplies there and then with horses and carts, they'd go down a rough sand track a few times to collect supplies. So in between, they grew basic vegetables, they went fishing, they had cows and goats to milk to make dairy products and they took the children at home. Because to get to Augusta was one and a half hours one way on the sand track and Augusta was really small. So they're pretty self-sufficient. And the keeper worked for three weeks and then got one day off every three weeks. Wow. Um, they were high pressure hosed that three times, yeah. then repointed it. That's all new wiring, it was completely re-stripped. And these floors and steps and those beams, that was all taken away and restored and brought back back in. Wow. The whole outside was scaffolded and they stripped and sandblasted it wow. and repainted it. And the sand, 18 tonne of sand was used to remove the outside paint. They had to bag it up in case it had lead in it. So it was a big job. Jeez. Yeah, it had 10 to 20 guys working on it for almost a year. And do you know the lights? Yeah, so that was, uh, well they had a, a wooden roof on top and they had a temporary light and a temporary cable and everything. So those windows, they originally new windows they put in? No, they were put in 15 years ago. They're from the 1960s. Yeah. But they took the windows out because they were putting stuff in and out for the service lift on the side. They were actually putting stuff in and out through the windows yeah. because there weren't any platforms left for a while. Oh, looks like the birds like that one. There's a little kestrel. That's there. a little kestrel. You can see its tail. On the bench over there used to be journals and they'd fill them in. And that's a legal document, so it's got to be pr pretty precise and pretty detailed, because if there's a shipwreck, an inquest or an inquiry, it's an illegal document. And I was given a seat, but it wasn't comfortable, because if it was, it was an old wooden seat. If it's comfortable, you might fall asleep at night. So it's designed to keep you awake. The windows are put around the way they are, so you can look for a t through a telescope for ships or whatever's going on if the weather's not good to be on the balcony. So you'd be outside with your telescope or in the air. So this is called a watch room. And see how the steps are red and green? That used to go all the way to the ground. And the reason for that is every couple of years they paint the steps and the old style paint might be dry and might be tacky, a bit wet for a day or two. But you still got to do your job. So if you paint, say, every second step red, for two days you'd go two steps at a time in the green when the red dries, you paint the green and you do two steps at a time with the red. Wow. So someone had to climb up two steps at a time. What they do is, like last year, they took all the steps out and painted them offside. But normally now, they just start at the top, whip their way to the base, and they just close the tower for a couple of days. But they've just left this colour to show what they were like, and now it's all baked. But one of the uh, steps below, when I unbolded them, it had a minute crack. Now all original, we had a million people less on the tools. And it didn't matter because in the back cupboard, amongst other spare parts, was two spare steps that had been sitting there for 127 years. So that level below has got a spare step from the 1890s. They fixed the other one they took out. So we've got more spares for the next 100 years. Now, just while I'm at this level, now be aware there's a beam here to watch. Just watch your head on this one. Okay. Okay, so those are the motors that turn the lenses. Now if one stops, there's enough momentum for one to keep them turning. But that's all the old gearing below. So, just there is where the keeper would put the handle and he'd wind the weight and then when the weight pulled the chain, that's the gearing that turned the lenses. So that's the original clockwork. 
Now, if you're winding the weight, the lenses kept turning because they had what they called a counterweight dropping from the top. So they had a main weight and a counterweight. Now, if you look at the motors, they're not really big. See what's up there turning? That's three and a half times. So that's like a big motor home, no cracks and nothing's inside. But when they did the repointing, they found the mortar between the blocks is a putty. And it actually flexes slightly as well. So it flexes and rocks certain down. So here you can lean against this. And if it's say 90 to 100 k an hour every few seconds, you feel movement. If it gets over 120, it just rocks constantly. I had a wonderful time at Cape Lewin and I highly recommend visiting this place if you are in Western Australia. It's a unique and beautiful destination that will leave you in awe of nature's beauty and power. Thank you for watching my vlog and don't forget to like and subscribe for more travel videos. See you next time.